Hello and welcome to Too Fast, Too Forever. There's all kinds of family, we chose this one. This is episode 230, The Five Venoms, or The Five Deadly Venoms, or just Five Deadly Venoms, whatever you want, whatever your flavor is. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe Too, and this episode's brought to you by Five Brother Workwear. When Morris Fine, a Russian immigrant, came to America in 1890, he started a company that was bound for greatness with great quality. Shout out to Five Brother Workwear. Well, shout out to Five Brother Workwear, and welcome to Too Fast, Too Forever. After the break, we will be joined by John Sino to talk about John the Cena? Five Venoms. I, it's very close. It's We're going to have to see if we can see him tonight or not. I don't know. We'll find out. We'll find out. But Joe, extracurricular activities, what have you been up to since we last spoke? I have been watching actually a ton of television shows. Okay. A ton. So Rachel and I caught up on From, the new show that's on, I think, Amazon, that mm-hmm. has Michael from Lost. The kid or the adult? The dad. Walt! Okay. Walt! That so guy. So Michael shouts Walt. Yeah, Harold yeah, yeah, Harold Perrineau. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Him, he's in it. It's a show about, so far, what, we, what I've discovered is it's a show about a town where, like, if you're out at night, there's, like, weird creatures, but you put this amulet or something like you put a goofy rock on your door and they can't come in your house okay and if you let them in your house then they just eat you from the inside interesting okay it's fun we've been watching that i can't really recommend it but because there's only like four episodes or something but it's been fun that's what we've been watching we watched that we finished the new season of upload which i really like that's a really cute show it felt like half a season though we watched it really really fast and when we got to the end we were like that felt like part A of a season. Yeah, that's a show that I want to watch. I have not seen yet. It's cute and wholesome more more than I thought it would be. And okay. like the, it's like, you know, just a, a very gentle sitcom. Um, we really like it. It's along those lines of things that we watch just for gentleness. We're watching a bunch of Severance. Um, really enjoying it so far. I do like it. And we watched uh, Don't Look Up finally oh okay Netflix. good yeah uh really really funny and satire oh so you liked it i did like don't look up yeah i thought it was i thought i thought the satire of it was funny the cast was pretty big like it was a decent movie it had it it felt very much like it had big short vibes you know what i mean so i love big short i hate advice i think this is somewhere in the middle okay yeah 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 that's that's a fair assessment, but like just like the editing, you know what I mean, like this kind of stuff. So I thought it was pretty good. But I love Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, my boy showed up in the middle of it. That was pretty good. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And um, I didn't know any of the cast or anything of what the movie was about going into it. Like anytime some new actor would pop up because it has a very robust cast. I would be like, holy shit. And Rachel's like, you really didn't know anything about this movie either. And I was like, absolutely not. There's definitely some funny parts. Uh, it's not a movie I'm like, you have to see or something. But I'm glad that I watched it. I was like, okay, that was cool. And then other than that, I will be heading back to Pittsburgh this weekend. I didn't even tell you that yet. But I will be heading back to Pittsburgh this weekend. Hopefully I have some cool news on the back end of this. It's my It was my dad's birthday. So... And cool. actually, my sister's boyfriend's birthday, so they're going to be there, and we were going to go tag along. And the first round of March Madness is being played in Pittsburgh, so I'm going to go to the games on Friday night. Oh, very, very cool. It's a fun one. There's, I think it's a, what, it's a 5 and 12 and a 4 and 13 are playing, so there's like heavy upset possibilities sure. yeah, yeah, yeah. right so uh so i'm excited um we've been watching a lot of college basketball due to degeneracy and um i'm excited to go see some games live possibly that could be an upset and i've never been to like march madness things before like i've been to college basketball games but like not march madness things so i think this will be a fun little uh outing how about cool. you, sir? What have you been up to? I've been trying to think. I don't think I've seen anything really of note. I've been doing a lot of podcast stuff. I think that was part of the, like when we were scheduling the Caligula episode, the bonus episode oh, for the show, yeah. I was like, I just don't want to watch a two and a half hour movie 
that I don't really want to see right now and then do another expo. Because like on Friday night, we did a lotto pod and then Sunday, Mike came down. And so we did an episode of Hanks and an episode of Elvis. And then Sunday night, John and I, John Brooks and I, past guests of the show, started recorded the first episode of another show called 1999 The Podcast, which is we've announced coming out on April 4th, I think. Uh, I'm sort of hands off on that. That is the first show I've ever done where I'm in the Joe 2 role, where I'm just like, hey, man, whatever you want to do, I'm there for the ride. And it's weird. It's, it's weird. That's kind of, it's, does it feel nice, though? I don't know. Like, it's nice. It's weird in the moment where he's doing most of the talking on the episode, and I'm just like, Okay. After the fact, after we're done recording, I'm like, okay, I don't have to worry about anything. So that's nice. It's nice in that regard, for sure. Yeah, that's really awesome. Good for you. I know that sometimes your scheduling can be very, very tight, so I'm glad that you have that kind of... Yeah, this is a show that John has wanted to do forever. It's about the movies of 1999, and I was like, I, I'm i interested in it, but I just don't have the time, and I definitely can't do any work on top of it, outside of it. But, like, I can watch a movie every couple of weeks and talk about it. So he's doing everything, and I'm just like, okay. But it's it's still, it's it's fine. We did one episode. We're going to do another one, I think, maybe on Monday. Another one, like, you know, we're going to backload a couple before we launch, but, like, I was trying to figure out, like, where my time goes. I'm like, oh, just because it's it's watching things or recording things or editing yeah. things. Just, like, it all just, you know, I love it, but... I was going to say, um, for any listeners that are not patrons, the episode of Caligula with Brian was a ton of fun for a movie that is primarily two and a half hours of dicks. Yep. As always, Brian makes it a good time. So we had a lot of fun talking about how wacky that movie was considering it is almost literally just a porno yes yes <laughs> right? yes, yes so if you want that like i think that's our 18th bonus episode we've a lot of them not most of them but like probably four or five with brian so there's a lot more brian over there so if you want to join for that basically a bonus episode every month you get the early access to every episode you get access to all sorts of stuff i mean like the real the gem over there is just brian making us watch things that we wouldn't otherwise watch we wouldn't otherwise talk about yes and just doing that so you know and him being even zanier than usual yes for sure he lets his guard down he lets you know has an extra drink turns down the lights a little bit Turns up the smooth rhythm on the the, the dial of his podcast machine. <laughs> and yes, just exactly. you know, goes for it. Yeah. That was it. Uh, I've been playing video games. I've been playing Elden Ring. Killed the dragon yesterday, which was cool. I'm still so early. Like, I've been talking to friends who are like, like some some of my friends have already beaten the game, which I'm just oh, like, Jesus. Wow. But okay. I have other friends who are just like, you know, pretty far into it. And like, they're all just like, well, you need to explore more. I'm like, I just need to play more. Like, I just haven't done anything. And so... Uh, I just have to find more time again that goes into the podcasting thing, but like I, I'm really enjoying Elden Ring. It's still very difficult, but I just need to, you know, I want to just play video games. I'm just like, nope, got work to do and like actual work and podcast work. But uh, yeah, Elden Ring's good. If you, have, I mean, they just put up numbers. Like it sold like 12 million copies in three weeks. So like, it's making a ton of money. Um, every people, everybody who has it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So. But like we said, we have a Patreon page on the show, Too Fast, TooForever.com. Shout out to Cassie Wilson, Jake Freer, Ben Milliman, Nick Burris, Alex Ellen, and Justin Kleiman, Brian Rodriguez of High School Ooh. Slumber Party, Haley Gerbys, Wes Hampton, Christian Larson, Jerry Robinson, Dan the Duke, Hayden, Renato DiDonato, Michael McGann, Lane Middleton, Lindsay Lewandowski, Nate Milton of the Kings of Sport, Jason Rainey, and Jessica Collins, a.k.a. Mon Tez. Thank you all so much for supporting us the $5 a month level or above. New lap starting in one month. So get in now, get a pick for that new lap, and do that thing too fast, too forever.com. We also have an email address, family at cageclub. I mean, Joe, we only have three YouTube comments. Dr. Feelgood saying, what a joke on Dirty Mary Crazy Larry. <laughs> Steve Yo. Ellis 900 saying, rubbish on Vanishing Point. <laughs> And Candice Nayuzani on Turbo saying watch. So thank you to all of our dedicated listeners on YouTube. They make me so happy. The YouTube comments, like, fucking send me. Um, they also, my friends, I forwarded them into our group chat, and they also found it very enjoyable. So, uh, hey, Motor Mouse, if you want to leave a YouTube comment that's just grumpy old man, go for it. They make me, they actually make my day. As Rachel did the sleuthing, the person who said rubbish, I believe, one of them, one of them, one was, of them, yeah, had, had made an account the day before or the day of <laughs> to leave a comment. Basically, it's like, all right, man. 
I want to know how pissed you got at us to be like, th that's like, the, like, I don't review anything, but this really sucked, you know? Yep. Yep. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you guys get it. I mean, like, it's it says, the Fast and Furious podcast about this movie, not like, you're, you're not like, hey final rip of this movie whatever you know i'm you know who i'm gonna blame for this i'm gonna blame i think either matt or zach one of your friends very early on made a note that was correct that they what they said was correct and that you said to me and i'm like that's a good idea but i used what? to say too fast too forever podcast colon or number like 111 colon fast five lap five or whatever but one of your friends was like we should put the you should matt. put the name of the yeah. movie first and then the too fast so like i think although maybe not i'm just kind of like i'm trying to I'm trying to figure out a way into the minds of these these complainers on youtube where like if we have put like if it starts a too fast too forever podcast it might have been like oh okay like i know it's a podcast but they would still be upset i'm i'm almost i almost guarantee that yeah, they'd be upset still they wouldn't have cared yeah you know but we can blame matt or zach i think that's still like it was, know, maybe it was definitely them. matt it was definitely matt but um yeah he he was like oh you know for like seo just put the movie name first that way, uh -huh. like, if you're looking for the movie, somebody will be like, oh, maybe this is all... He's not wrong. He's not wrong. But I think, That's how but it should he's, work. He's helping us bury the, the word podcast. So, you know, yeah. oof. Yeah. So, if you're going to email us, family at cageclub.me, we can't just read YouTube comments. Send us real emails, family at cageclub.me. We also have a store at toofast2forever.shop. Also, I wanted to say that um, uh, Haley, like, really jacked up her ankle so feel better Haley. she sent me something about like her and she was like oh wait joe didn't tell you i'm like i don't know like joe rem remembers like one thing that you tell him like three weeks after you tell him and he's just like yes. oh Haley said this thing and i'm just like yeah okay and she's like we love that adhd brain and i'm just like yeah some of us do some of us don't. <laughs> yes so so you know so J i just wanted to wish wish her feeling better that was yes that was my point Joe, on the streets, news about the Fast and Furious. Anything you've seen? Because I don't think that I have seen much. No, I haven't seen anything besides what we're going to talk about next. Yes, Young Rock did start last night, so now available now on Hulu and Peacock if you want to do that thing. Oh, I forgot to watch, what's it called? Endgame. Yeah, I forgot to watch Endgame because I watched Young Rock and I got distracted. So That's fine. You can that. talk about two episodes next week. I'm sure that, like... It's still going to make no sense. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure too. But I just realized now that we're doing Young Rock that like, yeah, I forgot. I would also imagine you could probably skip episode four and just watch episode five and it would be fine. <laughs> I mean, but what about the the USB that was in the Clover fucking book? Joey, I want to know I what I don't happens. know, man. I don't know, man. Someone has to do the, war the Lord's work and that somebody is going to be you. Yeah. Tickets to Morbius, the new Jared Leto in the Spider-Verse kind of Sony movie, are on sale now. The only reason I'm bringing it up is because Tyrese is in that. So if you want to support your boy Tyrese, movie I, comes out, I think, the end of the month, maybe, or beginning of April. It's like it's two or so weeks away. I want to get it, and thank you for reminding me, but you did it very late, and now I won't get opening night tickets. So thanks a lot, Joey. I don't think anybody cares about Morbius, but I apologize nonetheless. Thanks. I don't think so either. But yeah, I'll get some Morbius tickets. Good call. Is this what is it? Is it like it's in it like half a Marvel movie? What is the like? Well, so Sony like the Sony and Marvel's deal right now is that they're allowed to use like characters are allowed to go back and forth. I think, but like I don't know. It's not in the MCU. I don't think. Although now with the multiverse, it maybe is. Yeah, because it felt like they were pitching it like it might be in the MCU, but then. It doesn't have the whole, like, was it, it wasn't on, like, the timeline either, like, the MCU, like. No, it's a different thing altogether. It's a Sony I mean, production. Because yeah. yeah. Sony's got, like, a Spider-Verse that they're doing, like, not, and not just into the Spider-Verse, which is, there are two, two sequels to that, but just Spider-Man movies. Like, today, Sydney Sweeney of Euphoria said that she's going to be in this new movie called Madam Web with Dakota Johnson. So, like, that's another Spider-Man property. So, like, there's just a bunch of Spider-Man shit going on on Sony, because I think they're, he might be the only one, like. Sony owns the rights to Spider-Man. Marvel can use it. Yeah, Fox was maybe deal. owns the rights to X-Men. Marvel can use it. Or maybe Marvel got those rights back. But, like, for a while, it was, like, Fox does the X-Men movies. Sony does the Spider-Man movies. And Marvel can't use them. They can use everything else. But, like, they, they've reworked it out so, like, everything can be used by Marvel. But who knows? Which is yeah. Disney, right? So, speaking of news on the streets, Joe, is Twain Johnson in F10? 
No. I did see Reaction Rocket tweet is free larger than F10, so we could ask that too. Although that seems like it's... What do you think is more likely? Brie, Brie and F10? Brie. Yeah, probably, right? Yeah. Brie. Very what's likely. more? What's more likely, Brie to be in 10 or 11 or The Rock in 10 or 11? Brie to be in 10 or 11. If, I, I, think if you, I think if you open up to like the rest of the main franchise, we have Dwayne has a pretty good shot. Pretty good shot to come back. But yep. if you're making uh, DraftKings bets, what are the odds? Oh, for Dwayne to come back? Mm-hmm. Plus. Can you bet on that? Can you do like weird Hollywood prop bets like that or no? No, no. On the offshore books, sometimes they let you take like wacky stuff, like not DraftKings or FanDuel. No, I would say Dwayne Johnson back in the Fast and the Furious got to be like plus eight hundred, like eight to one. So eight hundred, just just plus eight hundred means that if you bet a hundred, you get eight hundred dollars back. Yeah, eight to one. In addition to your hundred dollars back. But I think that that's because, like, you know, because there's, like, a history of him being in them. Uh, th we have time, right? Like, it's, like, it's a future. Nothing bet. but it. Yeah, exactly. So. I'm still sort of surprised we've got no word on Hobbs and Shaw 2. Same. Very much same. Especially after just re-watching it. Like, what's happening? And it's not, I guess The Rock is doing Young Rock. But, like, what's Statham doing? He's not doing anything. He's got uh, Operation Ruse de Guerre. But, like, I feel like when Hobbs and Shaw was in theaters, or, like, right after that, they're like, yeah, we're greenlit. Greenlit, So it's yeah. we're doing a second one. And then, like, nothing in almost three years now. I can't... But no, 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 we did, because we got that rock news that, like, rock is like, oh, yeah, like, I have an idea of us to, like, go off into well, the sunset. I, but that also just like... might be him promoting another project. They'd be like, hey, you ever want to do Hobbs and Shaw 2? He's like, yeah, you know, I have this idea for one thing. Like, it might not be there doing it. That's true. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It, it'll... Also, it's it's like a completely separate thing from him being like, we started shooting, or like, he's like, I have an idea for the story. That doesn't seem like anything's even remotely close to being done. So on Statham's IMDb, there's Operation Fortune Roost Gare, which just got delayed, which should come out soon. There's The Expendables 4, which is coming out sometime. It doesn't have a date, but it's in post-production, so maybe this year. He's filming The Meg 2. The Trench, which comes out next year. There's some movie called The Beekeeper. He's apparently Spy Two is announced. We've been talking about Spy a lot this lap. Uh, Spy is great. That's been announced, and some TV show called Viva La Madness has been announced. The Beekeeper is following an unconventional story with universal themes, deeply steeped in the mythology of beekeeping. That doesn't feel like a Steven movie at all. What is this? We just watched Castle Kingdom Siege and Conquest, so. Uh, true. Yeah. It's very true. Oh, this guy, the guy who's writing it, this is not good, is basically, he's credited on writing a lot of the movies on, like, the, a lot of the action movies that have, like, easily been knocked off or are remakes themselves, like the new Point Break, the new Total Recall, the new Children of the Corn. He wrote the Angelina Jolie movie Salt. He wrote Law Abiding Citizen. He wrote Street Kings. Like, he wrote all these movies that are just like, yeah, like, those are kind of successful, but, like, nobody loves these movies, so... We'll see. where you, And then Viva La Madness, a drug dealer trying to get out of the criminal world is roped back into it. That is, yes, that's yeah. much more Statham. That's very much more Statham. But no other news. Nothing else you've seen? No, nothing else. Now let's talk about season two, episode one of Young Rock, Unprecedented Fatherhood. Is that what it's called? Is that what yeah. the title of the episode? Yeah. I have a question for you that I that I didn't look up because I thought I would ask you. Is the woman that is his girlfriend is that his wife that like half owns the XFL now? Well, so I don't I didn't look up the actress, but Danny, the character she's the character, playing. That's what I mean. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Oh, because that's that's college Dewey, right? Yes. So yes, Danny is his wife or his business partner. Yeah, I don't know. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's what I was trying to figure out because like for him to bring her into this episode. If she's just, like, a random... And he's, like, she's super mode, Like, you know what I mean? It felt like he's kind of running promo for her a little bit. Sure. Right? Yeah, it would be kind of weird to be like, yeah, my college girlfriend was awesome. Let me tell you about her. It's just, like, some yeah. woman that he's not with. Yeah. No, that's, that's the woman he marries. Yeah, and it's not, like, involved in his life at some point, right? We did know that, like, his ex-wife was still in the partnership of him buying the XFL. So I was, like, I kind of assumed it had to be her. I really like this show. Did you like this episode? Do you like this show? I thought it was great. Yeah, that's Danny Garcia. Uh, married her in 97, got divorced in 2008, but she's still around. She's and still, then, like, very heavily involved in his business doing. So, like, they're still, like, buds. Yep. And then he married Lauren Haitian uh, a couple years ago. So, uh, yeah, I like the show a lot. I like uh, I like that we got all three Deweys to kick it back off. I like the little Dewey's dreams, his daydreams, kind of. 
Yeah, that's fun. And I haven't... That was a weird experience because, like, I haven't, ha like, thought about that. But when I was a kid, I definitely had, like, weird, vivid imaginary... You know what I mean? Like, I'm just gonna flip this table. And you're like, no, you're not, right? Because you're just, like, a small child. Did you ever have this? I don't know if I've had that, but I definitely feel like I had visions. Like, at one point, he's watching his dad on TV. And then, like, the way they edited him, like, oh, wait, he might be actually getting tagged into this. Yes, yeah. And then it's just like, no, he's just, like, falling asleep on the couch and just, like, wishing he was a wrestler. But, yeah, it was, it's super cool. It wasn't, like, visions, but I definitely had thoughts of, like, I'm going to do this cool, fantastical thing. And you're like, well, I'm not because I'm a small child. But, like, you think about it, right? It's like the, yeah. And then they, for them to make it visual was pretty cool. Um, I really like that. Yes, I did like that we got The Rock doing more goofy shit, like fishing for no reason. I don't know if I've ever seen him fish. He's a good fisher. He's singing the song Desperado and sending it to his daughters. Dude, when the Desperado thing came up, I was dying because now... You've seen the episode of Seinfeld with Desperado. Which one is that? Remind me. It's the Fardman. When he has the, the chest of drawers, and also there's a bunch of Japanese guys running around, and Kramer oh, puts them yes, in the yes, drawers. Oh, yes, 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 And Desperado is his song, and he can't hear it, and Elaine wants it to be Witchy Woman can be their song. Yes. <laughs> right. Okay, so is there any song that you feel very strongly about? I like Witchy Woman. Witchy woman? You know, witchy woman. Oh, witchy woman. Ah, oh, witchy woman. But every time he hears Desperado, he shushes her so he can hear the song. So, yes. <laughs> that's a very good episode. I like that one a lot. Uh, so when I saw Desperado in the episode, I obviously only think of that episode of Seinfeld every time I see that song. What I thought was interesting about this episode is that the first season is him running for president, and I'm like, I wonder if they're going to jump forward in time, I wonder what's going to happen, and Randall Park back as the interviewer, and he's yes. just like, you know, in our final two weeks leading up to the election, I'm like, oh, so that's going to be this entire season also, right? Like, it's going to be like, we're going to have two weeks, because they could easily do like, and with nine days left, with eight days left, with seven days left, and like, you could tell like a life yes. lesson each day, right? So. Yep, 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 I think so too. But at the very end, we get the sort of the through line is that Sean Astin, who is a child actor and just has been around forever, he joins the show. There was news that came out like last week that he joined the show, which, of course, he joined a while ago because, you know, they filmed it all. But he's Dwayne's former schoolmate who's like posting on Twitter like he's a bad dude. People need to hear my story. I'm like, mm, OK. And it's like right at election time. So you're going to get the whole like bad news leaks right before the election. Yep. And I think that it's going to be like... um. The Rock's going to be like, I'm a much different person now, right? Yeah, like, let me tell you what really happened. Like, I, I have to own up to some that. stuff. Not even that. It's going to be like, uh, I've atoned for that and look yeah. where I've come from. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's not like the, oh, his version of the story is different. It's going to be like, I get that I probably did that. And he it sucked, but yeah. Yep. The only other note, I mean, we have, what I like is the, he's got the, Stanley Tucci award-winning cookbook, Can You Cook What the Rock is Cooking, which I thought was pretty funny. <laughs> yes, I agree. I like that a lot. And then I also like just how we had with the players at the U, at the University of Miami, when he joins the Calgary Stampeders, we have Doug Flutie and Jeff Garcia, who both obviously go on to be like really successful NFL quarterbacks. So yes. it's cool to see them in the CFL as well. I agree, and I totally didn't know that Jeff Garcia started in the CFL. Yeah, Flutie, I think, is famously from the Canadian yes, Football League. Yes, I agree, I, yep. I feel like I like I wasn't surprised to see Jeff Garcia there, but I'm also like I don't I don't think I knew that. So yeah, I'm with you. Okay, yeah, that's that's the exact same feeling that I had about it. Flutie for sure. I remember Flutie being like, he's the guy. It's like Tommy Maddox with the XFL, right? Like, yep. Mm -hmm. It was always that thing. Any other thoughts about uh, the season two premiere of Young Rock? I liked it. I liked the show. It's cute. I uh, I actually specifically waited to watch it with Rachel because um, I think she kind of enjoys it too. So. Uh, we watch it together, and I'm ready for next week's. Cool. Well, then the final thing to do before we take a break and bring in John to talk about the five Venoms is the Fast and the Furious Minute for Too Fast, Too Furious, a minute I called Brian's Gambit. Oh. Yeah. 
kid. Let's see if we got the ball. Come on. In this minute, Fabio speeds through the finish line, allowing Fonzie to start his half of the race. Fonzie taunts Brian as he widens his team's lead. Tej, Suki, and Jimmy look on nervously. Roman finally crosses the finish line, letting Brian start his leg. Fonzie speeds around the barrels to the end of the track. Brian swerves into the oncoming lane to initiate a game of chicken with Fonzie. Fonzie caves. He loses the game of chicken and swerves aside to avoid Brian's car as the minute ends. So after a couple minutes of just like, all right, we're still on the same like leg of the race, we get like a lot of narrative momentum here, which is cool. It is very, very cool. Yeah, we change drivers now. We get the game of chicken, which is very famous. Uh, this was a tight, compact minute. I really liked it. And we get like, and the way it was split, like the swerve off happens like right as the end, the minute ends. So pretty cool yeah. to me. I was wondering, like, because as I'm watching the first time, especially, I'm, like, checking, like, the timer. I'm, like, okay, 53 seconds, 54 seconds, trying to, like, figure out where it's going to end. And, like, there's a couple different places it could end, but, like, it ends in a really cool place. I'm, like, all right, cool, nice. I like that. Same. We get the score back, which is nice. A song called Brian Makes It by David Arnold. So, spoiler, it sounds like Brian's going to win this race. <laughs> I was also seeing this like a, like a little thumbnail preview for each minute. So in two minutes, I know we're no longer going to be here. We have at least one, more, obviously, because we end in the middle of a race, right? But like we have at least one more minute. And then in minute 55, we're somewhere else. So okay. we're almost done. But that's it's been a while we've been here. We have been here for, for quite a minute, for sure. And the only other thing that I wanted to note was that it was nice to see, I thought it was funny to see Fonzie and Fabio's women, like their ladies, pump their fists in celebration, like so excited when Fabio crosses the finish line. Like he's celebrating, they're like, yeah. Like they yeah. just have nothing to do, but like here they're just like, yeah, we're cool. All right. And then Suki, Tej, and um, Jimmy all look like, very, like, oh God, are they going to pull this off or not? Tej just says, I don't know. Yeah, exactly. But what did you notice here? This is not really a, a real minute for you to find new things, but what did you get here? I noticed something very, very cool in this minute that I had never noticed before. As Fon, Fon no, not Fonzie was the first driver. Fabio was the first driver. Fonzie's the second driver. Okay, Fabio was the first driver. Fonzie's the second driver. As Fonzie, you are takes, so going to get that trivia question wrong. Oh, I know. I definitely know. So as Fabio takes off from the starting line, he drives by. For a split millisecond of a moment, you can see a giant sign for 2003 Mitsubishi Eclipse. It okay. also has some Spanish written on the bottom of it. And that's really, really funny because in this movie, as we just saw seconds ago, literally, Tyrese is driving a 2003 Mitsubishi Eclipse. True. So it's like it's even more in movie advertisement. It, I don't think it is, and the other thing is the sign is so big that I think that, like, there was really just a sign for a 2003 Mitsubishi Eclipse on the side of this building, just happenstance, as they're shooting the movie featuring this car in front of it. Sure, that. yeah. Like, they don't focus on it, you know what I mean? And it, like, and it had Spanish written on it, and it was, like, a big, like, a really big sign on the side of the building, so, like, if they did put that there for no reason, like, it's strange that it's it was up, you know? Sure, yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought that was really, really cool. That was, like, my major-ish, most major thing I found. Then I added some, like, stickers on Brian's car, things like that. Um, as you said, it's really not a great minute for me, so that's what I was mainly mainly hype on. When well, I like, you have, you have the most to do when we go to a new place, like, when there's new backgrounds, and we're in the same backgrounds, we're still in the same backgrounds, we're still gonna be in the same backgrounds, so it's not like and you're... And also, the racing yeah. parts, because the, the, the movement of speed, you can't read any of this, so, like, they do pass signs, but, like, even, you know, pausing the movie essentially frame by frame, there's just ones that you just, you can't read, they're just, it doesn't work. So. Right. And also, like, in terms, I thought you were, were going to go somewhere else in that, like, when we have, like, a three-mile race, like, I'm thinking about the beginning of four, right, where Brian and Tom are both trying to get into uh, Compost's team, right? We're, like, going through Los Angeles, even though, like, it's a long race, like, we're different places. This is literally a street where they go down and back and down and back. And so, like, even it's if everything times. is slow, yeah, 
you're not seeing different backgrounds. You're just seeing the same background two or three or four times, right? So Exactly. Yeah, thank you. I have two different possible trivia questions here. I like one, and I had I, and one of my thoughts was very, very much similar to this. Go ahead. So one is one that we've done a lot sort of similarly before. What nickname does Fonzie call Brian after he starts his leg of the race, which is Blondie? He says, as you heard, sorry, Blondie, how's that dust taste? The other one, which I th- I'm guessing you like the second one more or no? No, I was thinking along the terms of the first one because you can oh, play okay. Blondie, Bullet, Brian, you Buster, know what it, yeah. mm-hmm. Buster we, all of these. And and the second question I had, yeah, because there's I, – I like the second question. I thought you might like – as I watched it again after I wrote the second question, they kind of focus on a lot of different things. But the second question I wrote down was what does the com- camera focus on – as Brian and Fonzie nearly collide in the race, and it's their eyes. They go back and forth like it's a duel in the good, the bad, and the ugly. But okay, we can do the first one. We can do the four Bs, right? Yeah, I think. Because it's really not hard, but these are all names that he's been called before by other people, and it I think it's it makes it more difficult than it is. Yeah, so question 56 from Minute 53, Brian's Gambit. What does Fonzie call Brian after he starts his leg of the down and back race? The answer is Blondie. Which I think if you have watched these and listened to the show and have taken the quiz, I think Blondie is the obvious answer. That doesn't mean it's like an easy giving one, but like, I think that's the one where it's like... You could do process some elimination. Does Ava Mendes call him? What does she call him? Roman says... Roman earlier says, is that true? Blondie here is yes. not a cop anymore? So what name does Roman call Brian? We had Blondie, Blue Eyes, Bullet, and Buster. We could do that. Let's do the same ones. That actually makes it way worse because now we have two questions where two different people call him Blondie and you're going to be like, did you really make the same question twice by two different people? And I'm going to go back and unfuck myself. We also have what nickname does Monica Fuentes call Brian before they leave the U.S. Customs Service hangar? B, Blondie, Bullet, Cowboy, or Handsome? What is it? What do you think it is? Cowboy. Uh Uh-huh. I'm growing with you, Cowboy. Yep. So Roman calls him Blondie. Fonzie calls him Blondie. So just whoever wrote this movie, which is like, they have a one-track mind. Yeah. It's a good nickname for him. It's kind of like, for all of the names that they use, this one's pretty non-offensive, right, for Brian? Yep. Actually, I don't think we looked up. This movie was co-written by Michael Brandt and Derek Haas, who also wrote Wanted and the new 310 to Yuma. And a movie called Overdrive with our boy Scott Eastwood. Not really our boy, but, you know, Little Nobody. And a movie yeah. called Catch That Kid, which I feel like, oh, Catch That Kid I know of because that's one that Brian might want to do for an uh, upcoming lap hint, hint, wink, wink, because mm-hmm. it's a 12-year-old Kristen Stewart in the movie as the lead. I wonder if Brian knows that those writers who wrote that movie also wrote Too Fast. Oh, I interesting. Have no idea. Interesting. 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 Any other thoughts about the minute? Um, no, I'm, I'm excited for the race to wrap up. I'm definitely excited for the race to wrap up at this point. I agree. Well, let's take a break. Let's bring in John and let's talk about the five deadly venoms. This episode number 230. This episode is brought to you by Five Brother Workwear. Over the years, fine produced shirts and pants became produced by Five Brother Workwear Dakota, Washington, (laughs) (laughs) D.C. Shout out to Five Brother Workwear. Well, shout out to Five Brother Workwear with us tonight to talk about the Five Venoms or the Five. Again, I don't know what to call this movie because this movie is different. I don't, Joe, I don't know if Rachel told you, but she's like, Joe's not responding. I need to know which movie to get ready. And I'm like, I'm like, I, I hate to tell you that, like, because she's like, he only he said like some words, like I don't know. I'm like, I hate to like decide with Joe, but like this movie's got like three or four different titles. It's like mostly the same words. So, like if he said like words in any order, he's maybe not wrong. She's like, ugh. Yes. So we were both like commiserating that like we don't like to give you credit for things, but we're both like, you might not be wrong. I don't know. I don't know what you said, but she's just like he said something about like five and venoms or no, something. No, I said like, the five no. deadly venoms, but you know it's 
it's like the five venoms, the five deadly venoms, the you know what I mean. It, there's a whole bunch. Yes. We've talked about so this. before we introduce the guest, the only note I have about that is that it was promoted as the five deadly venoms, but some English dubbed prints shown in the U.S. are actually titled simply Five Venom. So it drops the the, just like Facebook, and drops deadly. So who knows? I don't know. Whatever. With us tonight, though, more important than the title, we have the host of the Shot in the Dark podcast on the Up Next Network and part of the Post Wrestling family, which anybody who listens to the show knows Nate Milton from Post Wrestling. We have John Cena. Hello, John. Hello, Joey. Hello, Joe. Thank you for having me here. Um, Shaw Brothers. Wow. I, when I heard you guys were, were covering these movies, I couldn't believe it. I was like, finally, somebody who's a... Uh, talking about things I love to talk about, so I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you. We were not going to do this one originally. We kind of had like a, an empty space. Like I like build a little bit of wiggle room in, and then you're like, I would love to do a Shaw Brothers. I'm like, well, we got, here's a bunch that we didn't do that we want to do, and you picked this one, so here we are. Yeah, absolutely. Five Deadly Venoms was always my favorite, and you guys were discussing like the different names. I always knew it as Five Deadly Venoms. I remember one time, I, my, my friend said he had a copy of it, and I went over because I was excited. I always heard about the movie. It ended up being the Five Fingers of Death, which is a totally different movie, and I was very, <laughs> very disappointed with that, uh, unfortunately. But uh, once I was finally able to get myself like an actual copy, it's it's been in, in one of my favorites, Shaw Brothers movies, definitely like in my top five. Um, it, it's up there for sure. This this is the first movie that we've done this lap that I'm finally able to crack open that Shaw Scope Volume One. Like I don't know mm. if you bought that Arrow Video box set that there's like twelve. Shaw Brothers movies in it or whatever, but this is the first one. The other ones that we did this lap didn't have, they weren't included in there, but Five, the De Five Deadly Venoms is, and so I was glad, and like, what's super nice about it is that there's Cantonese and Mandarin and English audio tracks, so like, they really go all out. There's like bonus oh. features, all sorts of stuff, so. Ooh, okay. Great, great packaging. But you said this is your favorite Shaw Brothers movie. How many of them have you seen? I've seen a lot. So to be honest with you, my introduction through and i'm sure a lot of people uh from my era were probably introduced to these through the wu-tang clan i was a huge yep. well, i still am a wu-tang clan fan but just growing up um my brother was a dj so he, he had a little bit older than me so he kind of introduced me to wu-tang when i was like uh what, eight nine years old so mm -hmm. once i started listening to them i fell in love with wu-tang first and foremost but then i started hearing all these samples and i'm like what is this like what, what are these movies you know <laughs> what's going on here and it wasn't until like years later when i started getting on like the wu-tang forums and, and web message boards and everything that i started finding websites that actually like broke down all the movies and all these in all these um uh songs that they would have and the first one I, I wanted to really figure out was from the mystery of chess boxing which was you know toe styles immensely strong and immune to any like once i heard that <laughs> i'm like what is this like what are these different snake styles and toe styles and i found out it was five deadly venoms and i had a friend who was like uncle was really big into these uh martial arts movies so yeah I, I, he put this one on and I, I, I fell in love with it um but yeah i love so many of the straw brothers movies anything with gordon lou um 36 chamber of shaolin shaolin versus wu tang oh yeah 10 tigers of quang tong invincible armor is one of my favorites um crippled of just so many of uh, crippled Aveng avengers like just i can go down like the list of them but this one just like i don't know something about this just felt special i think because when i saw this i was still like watching like power rangers and to me this was like kind of like power rangers in a way like each one has their own different color and different style and different animal i'm like this is really awesome so something about this movie just kind of always stuck with me and there was something I, I messaged. We have past guests of the show, Nico and Keva, who are on for an entire lap, and they love Power Rangers. And I messaged this to them and to Joe, but there are the five Rinchy warriors that become the five poison fingers in Power Rangers Jungle Fury. So they Ooh. did like an entire homage to this. So like there's definitely a crossover. Like not only is it just like the same kind of whatever, but like they literally are just like, hey, let's do a five venoms homage. Wow, I had no idea. Yeah, I think I stopped. I think I fell off of Power Rangers once they like went into space or whatever. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm done with them. <laughs> I literally just said that in the chat. That's like almost verbatim what my response to that was. So That's you're in the right yeah. place, brother. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like I've always, like I said, I've always kind of studied like the samples. I've, I've been into like music production. I actually worked at Wu Tang and RZA directly for a couple years, so I really got into the whole lore of it. One of my jobs I had to do with them was actually like transcribe the lyrics. So one of the things I really held pride with was when I did the lyrics was to actually um, acknowledge the samples that were used. I would make sure that they would actually be credited by name, like you know this is from Ten Tigers of Quang Tong or this is from Kid with the Golden Arm, whatever the movie would be. So I made sure to actually do my research, and this is like you know early days of internet, so it was really hard to like actually find out um which movie was from what or which sample was from what so um i kind of held that in pride that i was able to kind of figure this out and make like a little database uh online that. to yeah for sure so like that's it's always been one of my things to kind of figure out like not only like movie samples but music samples as well like what's being used and rizza is like a genius so he he was able to find things that like we couldn't even figure out so like years later that's awesome how was it working with them like 
tell us more. I want to know like what were you do like what what were you doing? How like how much did you talk to them? And like if you were talking to them about Shaw Brothers movies, that's the coolest shit ever. I want to hear all about it. Yeah, no, for sure. I actually went to go see one of the Matrix movies with like Method Man and Killer Priest, so that was a pretty cool experience. <laughs> that's um, so cool. But honestly, it started with me just being a fan, and I just like started getting onto the Wu Tang Corp at the time. It was like their actual website, and I was like transcribing lyrics with a couple of um couple of other people that were like big Wu-Tang fans but RZA was looking for like local people and I'm here from New York I'm in Westchester which is like 10 minutes mm -hmm. away from like New York City where the 36 Chamber Studios was and he's like hey if you can come down and you and somebody else that's like computer savvy want to come down and uh, give us a hand we need people to help us run this website so I did uh, next thing you know I started meeting people uh, Dreddy Kruger, Buddha Monk, who was down with like ODB's Brooklyn Zoo clan. I just kind of like connected with them and also helped that I actually made beats on the side. So I had, you know, production. So a couple of my, my beats actually ended up on a Wu-Tang Clan album, believe it or not. Wow. Um, yeah. At, on the eight diagrams album, there's a song called Weak Spot, which is interesting because that takes a sample from Five Deadly Venoms uh, when, they, <laughs> when they talk about their weak spot. So at the end of that, there actually is a little tidbit of uh, ODB talking over uh, instrumental, and that was actually part of a tribute beat that I made for ODB because it was right around the time that he passed away when I started to really work with them. So they actually took that and put it on the album. Um, I never got credited for it. I never got any financial gain to it, but anybody that knew me personally knew that was my my record. So it's like a personal pride of mine to say, hey, wow, like I actually appeared on a Wu-Tang album in one, you know, one form or another. But um, after that, I started working with, like, a couple, like, you know, obviously you guys know Wu-Tang has, like, a thousand members when yeah. it comes to, like, the Killer Bees and all that. So I started working with, like, Buddha Monk and the Brooklyn Zoo and a couple other guys, uh, 12 O'Clock, who's the brother of ODB, like, just random people that were, like, part of them. Um, I, I worked with and I, I kind of offshooted to, like, an uh, internet radio station called Chamber Music where we would work and interview a lot of these guys from Killer Army and Capadonna and a whole bunch of different members. So it was pretty cool. But, like, the main members I actually worked with from the clan itself uh, closely was RZA because I would literally see him in the studio um, all the time. And then I had a couple encounters with like Met the Man. Uh, I pretty much had a conversation with every member of the Wu-Tang Clan with the exception of possibly Ghostface Killer. And that's sad because he's one of my favorite members. He's the only one I never got a chance to really like meet and talk to. But everybody else uh, was really cool. I got to play with Chess, with Jizza and Master Killer. So just like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's like these are guys that are like literally like I looked up to as and I still do as like, you know, superheroes. They're like superheroes come to life to me so it was just an amazing experience uh haven't really like spoken to them lately but um last time i think i saw rizzo was when he actually did a live scoring for the 36 chamber of shaolin uh in new york city a couple years ago before the pandemic i want to say it was like 2019 and he was there and he literally did a live scoring to that movie with his with his uh production and soundtracks and that was that was amazing just the whole experience of that that's so cool, dude. That's really, really cool. Thank you. That's a great story. I love everything about it. And we know that that beat was yours. Thank you. Yes. Weak Spot. Check out the track uh, on, eight, <laughs> on the 8 Diagrams album. That's my beat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's only a little bit cooler than me seeing this movie at the Draft House and RZA being there for Q&A. Like, it's, you know, we're basically on the same <laughs> level. Like, I'm also friends with RZA. Uh, you know, it's fine. We might have the pod. I, I do... I, I do well, speak, speaking of RZA and Draft House, are you guys aware of the Staten Island Draft House that's supposed to be opening soon? I know it's been in talks for a while, but RZA's supposed to have his own actual, like, martial arts-inspired Draft House in Staten Island coming soon. That's out. so cool. Yeah, I, so, I didn't know anything about this. That's yeah, crazy. If, if you look it up, there's, like, some concept pictures. Uh, it was supposed to, like, launch by now, but obviously the pandemic uh, pushed everything back. But there was, like, an update a couple weeks ago where it's still happening, and there's literally, like, a... a, a, like a, a a Shaw Brothers inspired like section there with like cassette tapes and there's like a bar with like kung fu inspired drinks like they're they're going the whole they're you know they're obviously going to take it to, to the next level with RZA being involved but yeah I, I can't wait for it I, I I was a fan of his movie The Man with the Iron Fist like some people didn't really like it but I, I thought it was great I thought it was a great homage to the Shaw Brothers films yeah I think like, like I love the draft house I, I used to live in Austin which is where I saw this for the first time and I feel like the as they expand they're really trying to focus on more like individual branding so it's not just like the draft house thing but it's a draft house thing with a sp with specific like flavor and so for it to be like a rizza kung fu martial arts style like that just seems in line it's just that's awesome like it just it's so cool absolutely absolutely i also the only thing i remember from the q a and i, I mentioned this before i think and i don't know i don't remember who he was talking about because there's a couple of people that could talk about it, but rizza said the quote i remember is that's a cool ass vest so i don't know if he's talking about centipedes vest because centipedes is a cool vest if it's a yang's at the end because he's got a cool vest mm -hmm. if it's somebody else entirely but i know that something rizza loves about this movie is a vest in the movie so <laughs> take that probably for what you will. probably centipede he had that pretty cool like black and red vest which was, was pretty gangsta as rizza would probably say <laughs> for sure 
so this is ranked number 11. I don't know when, when this was on Entertainment Weekly's top 50 cult films of all time. Uh, obviously, there are influences all over the place, food all over the place, references all over the place. Like John said, and like John does, I'm sure it was on its Toad's intro on Mystery Chess Boxing. It was on intro Shaolin Finger Jab, Snake's intro on Snake's, the song Snake's by ODB, on the Born Chamber intro. And there was an all-female hip-hop group. I don't know if you worked with these guys, these ladies, John, but the Deadly Venoms, do you know about them? The Deadly Venoms, yeah. They were originally five members, and unfortunately they went down to four, so that's why they had to just call themselves the Deadly Venoms instead of five <laughs> yep. Deadly Venoms. But yeah, it was basically like an all-female uh, offshoot of the Wu-Tang Clan, and they, you know, were pretty, like, even in, their in one of their videos, they actually had, like, the five Deadly uh, Venoms mask, so they definitely were inspired by that. That's uh, awesome. There actually is a a couple other songs that sampled from this movie as well. There actually was a song on Master Killer's first album um, where it was like kids rapping. It was like his son. I think the song is called The Future. It was his son, Jizz's son, and somebody else's son. And they were actually rapping over like an instrumental part of this movie. It's one of the actual like music cues that I recognized right away when I rewatched this movie. I'm like, that's from the Master Killer album. So they took that and kind of looped it up in a beat and they actually rapped over it, which is pretty cool. So it was actually one of the first like actual music that was sampled from five daily venoms that was turned into a track but yeah you got it pretty much everything else yeah i also noticed and i'm sure everybody who watched this who knows who like again our age watched the movies but like there are sound effects that tarantino rips and uses in kill bill like the, yeah. the axe throwing and just like sounds of like people surprised like showing up and also obviously the the deadly viper assassination squad is basically just the five venoms right like it just yeah. there's five snakes there's five things these five venoms named after the five poisonous creatures of chinese folklore so like there's basis there like there's chinese mythology there it's also on a tupac album st stuff from this monty python the holy grail uses music from the fight scene in this i don't know why uh it's referenced <laughs> in kim's convenience someone refers to it as quote the best kung fu movie ever oh, and it's yeah, also the name of a that. poison right. shop in world of warcraft's capital city stormwind so not just music not just wu-tang but everywhere movies video games tv shows people love this movie and people love talking about it do you think that the shaw brothers movies would be as big if wu-tang didn't like if rizza didn't love shaw brothers movies do you think they would be as big probably not because i feel like rizza and wu-tang made like i mean me personally i wasn't really aware of these movies till wu-tang and wu-tang mm -hmm. itself was like a huge a huge thing for new york and hip-hop in general so i feel like it definitely opened up a lot of people's eyes to these type of movies at one point, they even started re-releasing, like, the old movies on VHS, and it had, like, the Wu-Tang music videos attached to it. I remember I had a couple of VHSs, actually, like, you bought in, and here's the, you know, the Mystery of Chess Box in the music video at the end, or RZA has some sort of, like, interview or interlude during the actual VHS. Uh. So, it def yeah, so it definitely got a lot of people, um, I think, back into it that weren't really aware of it. Because I know when I was, you know, growing up, these movies weren't being played in theaters. Like, you know, RZA says all the time when he grew up, him and ODB would go to, like, Times Square, 42nd Street, and watch these movies, you know, it was like a double feature, <laughs> triple feature. Uh, but we didn't have that, unfortunately, we didn't have that capability until, like, years later when people started doing that. But, yeah, like, once, like, he started talking about these movies, I was looking for them, and I'm sure a lot of people were as well. Yeah, I think the thing to keep in mind, Joe, is that there's probably, like, hundreds of movies that are, like, cool like this that just got lost the sands of time. Like, that's what I'm saying, yeah. Yeah. Like, and without, I think without RZA, like, sampling them, seeing them, so, like, the whole transpirings of like RZA going to see double features with ODB to watch these movies and then sampling pieces of them and then bringing them into the lexicon probably like saved how many of these films from just like falling, right? Yeah, and then like, you know, to go back like in a circle again, he worked with Gordon Liu when it came to like Kill Bill. Like he was doing the score for that while Gordon Liu was was playing, you know, Pai Mei. So it was pretty cool like to him actually get to work and meet these guys um after the fact. Yeah, cuz those have to be like his heroes, right? Like like you're saying like you want to go hang out with Wu Tang, like he has to be like, "Oh fuck, I got to hang out with Gordon Liu today." You know what I mean? Like the other way. So exactly, really really yeah. cool to think about. Also, all these people, like, not all these people, but a lot of these people go on to not only do more Shaw Brothers movies, like you mentioned earlier, John, Crippled Avengers, like, there's a couple of these guys that show up there, but also one shows up as a small part in Ricky O, which we love on this show. Yeah. Uh, there's also, they show up in Hard Boiled, they show up in the It Man movies, then Grandmasters, so, like, all these guys, I don't know to what extent, but they all, like, go on to, like, this lineage of awesome martial arts movies that just you know bigger more prominent even more culty whatever but like the the branching out not only of like influence and like people loving it but just where they go it just you know keeps going which is awesome 
Oh yeah, it was their version of like what do they call it for like the '80s Breakfast Club guys that they have like their own pack growing up. Like this was like the their own pack, pack. yeah, mm-hmm. or the yeah. Brat Pack, the Brat Pack, and, yeah, yeah. Th- and this was the Venom Mob. They went ahead and made all these movies together. They made Cripple Avengers, Invincible Shaolin, uh, Flags of Iron. Like they just were a crew that worked together um, for like the next like ten years or so. I felt like so they were definitely like uh, you know a tight unit after this movie. The one thing I, I saw in my research that I thought was the coolest thing is that so there's it starts so the movie is about these this dying master is like i regret what we what i've taught i feel like the lessons that i've taught are being used for evil there's you know too much chaos in this world i need you uh yang to go out and keep find these people and make sure that they don't do anything bad and like reel them in if they whatever like we don't know where they are the guys like they could be anywhere they could change their names whatever but he's just like go out there also by the way there's treasure so just like figure that out too <laughs> like that's basically the movie yeah and what I love is that he has not finished his training yet, but he has the information from the master of like how to beat everybody. So like these other five guys are all kind of like bosses in the video game. And so they all have like a strength and a weakness and whatever. But what I thought was cool is because he's not in, he's sort of like a little bit of everything. Uh, he's known by fans as hybrid venom, which I've never heard before looking this up. And I'm like, that's such a cool nickname. He's just like a little bit of this, a little bit of that hybrid venom. I think is awesome. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of, like, uh, what is one of the villains from, like, Fantastic Four that was able to, like, take all the Fantastic Four's powers and, and make, like, a hybrid. That's what pretty much what he reminds me of. But, yeah, he's he's basically a yeah, hybrid Venom. I actually found that out myself. Uh, that's, I guess, like, a fan-made nickname that was given to him. But I thought that was pretty cool, the fact that, like, he, you know, gets a little bit of everybody's um, skills by, by being the last pupil of the Master before he died. Yeah. So, John, what do you love about this? I mean, I know that you, this is one of your favorite, if not your favorite, Shaw Brothers movie, but compared to other things that we've covered that we, you've watched, whatever, what, what about this stands out as your favorite of the Shaw Brothers? Um, obviously the fighting, the fighting styles are awesome. The fact that each one had their own style and each one had their own weakness. And you could actually, you could actually like differentiate which one is which by like the way they dress, by the way they, they mm-hmm. talk, by the way they look, which is like kind of always been a com- common complaint to me. And a lot of these movies is like, wait, who's what now? Especially with like the dubbing and the subtitles and like a lot of things are like lost in translation, uh, obviously, but this movie always like stood out to me as, okay, I know who's what, I know who's a bad guy. I know who's a good guy. I know who has what skills. And that to me, like always just kind of stood out. And then like the mask and just like the cover, I had like the old like dragon dynasty DVD that they released where you can actually see like the different masks that they wear. And that was always just like stood out to me. The fact that it was like so colorful and actually so bright that it made it like actually like stand out to most of the other movies. Like when I would show people like my collection, I'm like, what's this? What's five deadly venoms? Like something about that's just like, <laughs> stands out um you know that's more like appealing name than like a uh, 10 tigers of quang tongue like i don't know what that is but i know what five deadly venoms are <laughs> so let's let's watch that and i feel like from the get-go like the, it, it starts like right away like with the plot like you know what's going on like this guy's dying he's sending somebody to go and find his treasure and find his other students so it's like okay the movie starts right away with action like it's starting right now and here we go so i feel like right away it's, it's very easy to get into this movie Joe, where does the stack for you against the things that? Because have you seen Shaw Brothers movies that we have not covered? I know we did a whole month of them, but I, I think most of what we covered that we've we've done. So, like your experience outside the ones we've done for the show, and where does it stack to the other ones you've seen? Um, no, I watch all the ones that we've done for the show, the ones that we've done for Film Club, the like uh, all the Wu Tang ones, right? Yeah, like the yep. famous Wu Tang ones. So, like. I don't have a huge Shaw Brothers depth, but I, I do really enjoy them. Um, this one's r- really good. Well, so during this lap, now that we've watched like Eight Diagram Pole Fighter, I realized how fucking good that movie was. And watching this against it, I was like, oh, I really love Eight Diagram Pole Fighter. This one's pretty high up there for me. I do, I think probably I still like um, Enter the Wu Tang. Or the Thirty Six Chambers of Shaolin better, right? That one. Mm-hmm. I think I like I, I like the Gordon Liu ones. I like Gordon Liu a lot. Is is what I'm trying yeah. to say. So um, the Gordon Liu ones uh, always rank a little bit higher for me. But this one is still super cool and super enjoyable. I do like this one a lot. Because I think everything John said, like I love about this movie, like I love that there are five unique people, each with yep. their own, either their own color, their own mask, their own style. Like that's awesome. I feel like. With that premise, I want to see like a series of boss battles. Like I, I feel like it, it's weird. And John, maybe you can maybe you can sway me here. It's like I feel like it's kind of weird that it kind of becomes like a legal battle in the middle of this. Just like 
like it seems like you're they're setting up like these okay so you got you're you're not really there yet you might have to team up with one of them but like there's five guys you need to take down they have all these different styles and it's just like like learning a video like, it's like mike tyson's punch out right or it's just like you okay game, you have of, to, game of death or whatever right that you yes. go up the ladder that he yes. fights like each one individually that's what you want and I feel like, yeah, I think just like a series of boss battles, even though they are kind of equal footing, so it doesn't quite work that way, but just for it to be like, to sort of like be on the sideline and just kind of watch them like sabotage each other and try to betray each other to like get money. I'm like, there's so much cool here, but I wish that like it was a different story. But John, do you feel that at all? Or are you, are you like, are you cool with the story that's here? No, I can understand that. Like you might, from like the premise, you might like think it's going a certain direction, but then as it goes on, you're like, okay, it's a little bit different now. You have Centipede and Snake are together, and then Lizard and Toad are kind of together, and then we don't know who the hell Scorpion is. So yeah, I can see it like kind of like not really delivering on what it's like promised, but I would have liked to see like, it is, you know, one of the few movies I would actually see like to see remade if, I don't know if Reza has the ability to do this or anybody else, but this movie, if you take this premise and actually redo it now the proper way, um, I think it could be very well done. And again, like, I've never actually watched this movie um, in the original language with, with, like, the subtitles that are guests for that language, but I would like to, because I feel like the dubbing, a lot of things get kind of confused and, and mumbled. At one point, I think Yan even calls himself, like, number four, and it's like, wait a minute, what, since when yeah. are you a Venom? So a little thing's, like, a little confusing at first. I remember when I was younger watching this, it took me a while to understand who was who. Was who. It, like, I feel like they kept switching it up on me, like, okay, you just said you're number three, now you're number two. Like, they kept going from numbers to... to to animals like i was a little confused by that as i got a little bit older i was able to you know figure it out a little bit more but um i would i wouldn't mind this movie being redone and possibly like fixing those issues that we all probably see in it can you imagine if they redid this movie and it was akin to like mortal Kombat that just came out a little bit flashier like i'm seeing it like that and i think it would be so fucking cool in that sense i mean honestly i wouldn't be surprised if mortal Kombat took a lot from this i mean obviously you have oh, some yeah. of the names there but even like centipede's outfit like the black and red that looks something like that scorpion or sub-zero would wear like it looks straight out of mortal Kombat. so it wouldn't shock me at all if that was like one of the influences for those video games I think like, I guess now like now that you got now that you're talking about the the remake like i'm wondering who you would put in here like uh, you know like i'm thinking like joe taslam from fast and furious uh, Fury 7, I think, like Ika Ueyes, like you could have like Gordon Liu has to is he still alive, by the way? Yes. I think so. He's, he's still alive, yes. <laughs> then he's the old guy at the beginning that's dying, oh, yeah, right? For like, sure. A hundred percent. I think so. I mean you have a lot of the guys that are like were in like the Warrior show and even like uh the new G.I. Joe retaliation, a couple of like good martial artists that were in there. Like if you want to get like some like Hollywood names to it, uh even though like the new Mortal Kombat movie had a couple of pretty good actors, I'm pretty sure you can get it done. Um yeah, I'd be really intrigued on, on on how they would actually do this if it was like retold in the modern era. Yeah, get Donnie Yen in there because, like, so here's the thing. So, like, they're like, we're looking for people who are about sixty years old, and I'm like, there's no way these dudes are sixty. They're like yeah. thirty tops. Like, but you could do like if you wanted to have like an actually age appropriate whatever, like you could have people like from Ip Man and Grandmaster, or whatever, like these kind of older or sort of not like more statesmen or whatever, but like people have been around and then like sort of like the next generation and the next generation or whatever, like get Jet Li in there. Just like have like a badass, like sort of like the raid, whatever, but just remaking the five venoms. Cause I do think that like the building blocks of this are so cool. Yeah, I don't know if you guys might know more than I do, but, like, the Shaw Brothers, like, who has the rights to this? Can somebody actually make this if they wanted to? Or is, like, I, I, yeah, I don't really know, like, who actually owns the rights to all these movies that they wanted to, because I don't think any of these movies have ever been remade, as far as I know. Who owns the Shaw Brothers movies? Celestial Pictures owns Acquisition and Distri Distribution. Oh, because, I mean, the Shaw Brothers have more, like, almost a thousand movies. Like, it's not all kung fu movies. Like, they made a bunch of different stuff, but, like, they have almost, they made, the Shaw Brothers th Studio made almost a thousand movies. And so they have, like, 750, they have the rights to 750 of them. So, like, I don't know who Celestial is. Well, I knew that, like, when the Wein when the Dragon Dynasty DVD series came out, and most of them were, like, Shaw Brothers movies, that was a Weinstein company was putting those out. So I'm not sure if that was just a distribution deal or what. But, I mean, I know, I know that much, at least. Um, but, yeah, then Celestial Pictures got into it as well. But as far as, like, somebody wanted to remake it, like, I, I, I wouldn't know. I might have to ask Rizzo about that. <laughs> yeah, because I, I don't know, because, like, there's, you know, there's obviously, like, Arrow Video put out the, the box set. Like, we talked on here before about, like, Robert Rodriguez's El Rey Network shows them so... I, I don't know, because, like, you know, the box set is not, like, the 10 best or the wet, most well-known movies. Like, I think this might have been the only one of the 10 that, like, I had heard of. Maybe, I don't know if that's true or not, but, like, they're kind of under the radar. So, like, it might, might just be, like, a really nice restoration of, like, movies that could get rights to, right? Like, I don't know. Ah, uh, good point. Rights mm. are always really muddy and confusing. I don't understand. Yeah, then you have all these movies that have different titles. Like, you don't even know what you're getting some of the times when you're watching these movies. Yeah. 
Joe, do you have a favorite part, favorite moment, or do you have a favorite Venom? I, uh, I really like the lizard one because he can climb on the walls. I th always think that's really cool. But for some reason, like the toad one facing the Iron Maiden is also really cool to me. Uh, if I like, if I had to pick, those are always my two favorites. Like, I I don't know, strong defense, right? It's sure. like always a cool thing. And then climbing on the walls is just cool because it makes you feel like a little kid again. Because that's like just like a very fucking cool thing to be able to do. And like, it's something that I would always imagine that I could accomplish as a child. Yeah. So as a, I guess as a quick rundown for people who have not seen this, I think you can watch this for free on Pluto. I think if you want to watch it uh, with ads, of course. But there's the centipede, uh, who's people number one. He's red. He's really really fast, giving his blows the power to shatter bones and cause internal bleeding via rapid fire hits. But if he's attacked from high and low at once, he'll be defenseless. Then there's people number two, who is snake. Who? Oh, I forgot. I forgot to mention this earlier. Snake was originally meant to be a woman, which I think would have been awesome. Ooh. Oh. Okay. That would have been really interesting, yeah. Because, like, there's so much masculine energy in all of these, but, like, you think about, we were talking, I was talking about with Mike, uh, when Mike was over on Sunday to record Hanks with me, we were talking about Mako Kaji from, like, Lady Snowblood and Prisoner Scorpion and the Stray Cat Rock. It's just, like, there are such badass action ladies that, like, yep. you imagine you do, like, the remake and, like, Lucy Liu is in there, just sort of rep reprise the role of O-Ren, right? Or anybody, right? I'm sure people from, like, Warrior or whoever, right? So. Yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, it's funny you guys are mentioning Lady Snowblood. I'm actually wearing a Lady Snowblood shirt now. And obviously that was the inspiration for Oren Ishii in the Kill Bill movies. Yeah. There was a movie called uh, Come With uh Come Drink With Me. I forgot yes. the name of the, the, the lady that was in that, but she was she was awesome. She was like probably one of like the top like females in the Shaw Brothers movies that I remember seeing. Hey, Come Drink With Me is Cheng Pei Pei? Yeah, Cheng Pei Pei, yeah. She's and she was in the new Mulan movie too. Ooh. And Crouching Tiger. Yes. So awesome. I think that was one that, like, we were gonna maybe do. I think that's one of the bigger, more popular ones that we just didn't get to this lab. But yeah, Come Drink, I have not seen that, but I'm looking forward to seeing that at some point. Yeah, that was a great movie. Um, so let's see here. Snake, 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 Snake. Uh, snake had money. He came, like, he came from, like, a wealthy family, right? But he feels regret for his murders. Um, he's very precise, attacking the vitals, and he's very dexterous and flexible, but if he's attacked from two sides, so instead of high-low, it's like left and right, he can't. So like, it's just funny, like, when they're picturing, they're like, they just grab his left and right arm, they're like, oh, he's gonna stop him, which kind of is not what happens, but it's also, you know, alright, whatever. And then there's Scorpion, who is people number three, who's like the mysterious one. He uses deadly kicks, he's very, got an incredibly powerful grip, and he's got these hidden throwing darts, which is what dooms Toad eventually. Lizard is the guy who turns good. He can defy gravity, walk up and stand on the vertical surfaces like mm -hmm. walls. Yep. And he joins forces of the Yang. He's the only student to survive. And then Toad, like Joe was saying, is invulnerable to almost any kind of external harm unless it's behind his ears. Like that's his Achilles heel. It's just like the spots <laughs> in or behind his ears, which sap his strength to make him vulnerable. And he's the first to die because like when he's in court, Scorpion just like... No, I'm gonna throw uh, darts at you and just like show everybody your weakness and just kill you that way. It's just like that sucks, but yeah, it's also funny to be like I can't like they, they put him in the Iron Maiden. He just like breaks out immediately. It's like yeah, it's pretty badass. Um, the whole ears thing really threw me this time as I'm watching it because I'm like, okay, I get that like you know you can't hit him in his ears, but then I was thinking like if you fuck up your ears and you like have your balance going, like that would be so miserable to deal with. You know, like do you ever get like a cold? And you like you start to get like really like woozy and weird if your ears get fucked up. And I was like that, like because they even show it with the filming, right? Like it kind of like starts to distort a little bit and make them, you know, blurry or something like that. And I was like, man, that would really suck to have to deal with. And it kind of made sense why the Iron Maiden didn't affect him because his head wasn't in the Iron Maiden, right? It was popping out. So obviously the rest of his body was being punctuated and he was fine with that. I mean, obviously he was a little fatigued, but it didn't kill him. But then, yeah, the random uh, strike to the back of his his ear was what took him out. Yeah. yeah. John, who's your favorite of the Venoms? You know, funny, like, going into this, I always thought it was Toad. I'm like, yeah, Toad was my man, you know, his defense, like you guys said, like, he was, like, my guy going into this. But then, like, after watching it recently, like, I kind of like Snake. Like, something about Snake was just really cool. Like, he was just kind of lounging on the chair, like, eating his food, just, like, being really cool and cocky. Like, Centipede's a badass, too, but something about Snake just really resonated with me. I'm like, yeah, he's a pretty cool guy. He's, like, a bad guy they actually like. Um, so yeah, it might be one of those like things that changes every time I watch it. Kind of like when somebody asked me, could you fair a Wu-Tang Clan member? Like every day is yeah. going to be different. Um, but today I would have to go with Snake. I feel like he was a really badass dude. What I love about Snake is that I feel like in a lot of martial arts movies, because I have no 
real life martial arts training, but I feel like a lot of the styles you see, like they are sort of mirrored left and right. And what I like about him is that he's got the claw in his right hand, like sort of like the flat hand in the left, because it's like teeth and tail. And like, I feel like you don't see that very often. It's like usually like the seam in both, like it's claws in both or whatever. And so for him to sort of be like varied, it's like, that's cool. Like, I like that a lot. You know, for sure. And just something about him just like stood out. Like, I don't know what it was. Like, he was like cocky, but at the same time, he was like, not like a villain, like too evil, but he just kind of like, you know, seemed like a cool guy to, to cheer. We've talked about this before that like I have hair blindness. These are a bunch of actors that, like I kind of only know from these movies, so like I can't really tell them apart. But like the fact that they're just like in the same costumes, the same outfits the entire time, it's just like it's so helpful. It's just like okay, so yes. Snake is blue and he's always in white. Got it. So like I wrote these down. I'm just like okay, who? Okay, it's Snake. Got it. Cool. Very cool. Thank you. Yeah, like the only guy that I like I just never could figure out until the end is always Scorpion. I'm like, which one's Scorpion again? Like I know it's one of these guys, but like I just can't figure out who it is, and then they finally reveal it at the end and say, oh, Okay, that that was the guy. That's the one I always forget about until they reveal him at the end. I like it and I like it harkens back to what John was saying about like being like Power Rangers and stuff, and the just the visual cues like that is probably why people will gravitate so hard to this movie. Once you figure them out, you're like, okay, cool. It's easy to track them. Because in a lot of these movies, for me, I always confuse the guys, right? Because it's always like, dude with same haircut, same beard, same build, same height. So I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, which guy is this again? And then, but in this one, like, if you just give them different colors and outfits and stuff, you're like, I know exactly who this is. It's awesome. It's it's so smart. Like, it's so simple. But just like... yeah. Because you, it's, it's one less thing to worry about or think about. It's just like, because that's the thing about these movies. Like, when we watch for the podcast, like, I just want to sit back and, like, enjoy the martial arts. But I kind of, like, want to make take some notes so that I remember, like, what happened. We could talk about it. But just, like, that's one less thing I have to worry about. Like, I, okay, I don't have to I, – I know who's who just based on the color they're wearing. Then I can just watch, like, the beautiful choreography of, like, them, you know, fighting each other or fighting whoever and doing whatever crazy stuff. Yeah, and I think, like, one of the big parts, like, he's not one of the Venoms, but but Yan, just the way he, like, interacts with everybody and kind of is, like, that that bridge to all the characters. Like, he was, like, one of my favorite characters, like, in the movie overall, just because of, like, and obviously, you know who he is and what he's going to be re- revealed at, at the end, but to see him kind of, like, work his way into all the different uh, Venoms and kind of, like, figure out things here or there was, he's one of the key key uh, members of this movie, for sure. Yeah, let's talk about that ending, because it, it comes down to, it's like a two-on-two fight. And what do you guys think of that in compared, just on its own or also compared to, like, other ways that these movies have ended? Yeah, I mean, my one complaint about, I mean, you could probably say this about any Shaw Brothers movie, is they just end just out of nowhere. Like, I've seen yes. movies literally, yes. like, where they hit the final blow, and then the movie's over, the end. This one actually <laughs> had them, like, walk away a little bit. But, like, I'm looking at the runtime of the movie, and, like, there's, like, 20 minutes left, and I'm like, oh, man, like, it's going to be one of those movies where it just kind of ends without, like, the proper fight. Like, you're not going to get, like, your your crazy one-on-ones is going to be kind of like a brawl that's all thrown together at the end. That's pretty much what happened here. Um, you know, it wasn't a terrible ending, but obviously, like, it could have definitely been worked a little bit better, like you guys said earlier. Maybe like a, like a game of death style where it's like you're going through each boss fight one by one. Get it? That's like my one real huge complaint is I wish every Venom had more of like a spotlight individually opposed to kind of being bunched up together where you have Centipede and Snake together. And then, you know, like, that was my only real complaint is that, like, it was all kind of bunched up at the end, if you're going to do that, then have all five of them fight at the same time. We didn't even get that because Toad dies, like, what, halfway through the movie? So we didn't even get, mm-hmm. like, that all five Deadly Venoms together in one shot, which would have been a pretty cool thing. And, and that's kind of the weird thing about the setup, right? It's like, okay, we have five Venoms. They all have different styles. I've trained them all. But, like, they also don't know each other. Like, they've never really been together. It's just like, well, okay, so, like, we're going to get that in this movie. They're like, nope, you're not. You're not. <laughs> yeah. I think the jarring ending thing always gets me. I was watching, I was like, okay, there's, like, the fight, and then it just, like, ends, and I was like, oh, fuck, I forgot about those, too, like, that they just, like, are just like, okay, we're done, this is the end of the movie, just, you got enough, and I really do wish that they would have made a sequel to this, because, like, they make a lot of these into, like, trilogies and whatever, right, so, like, can't we just get, like, the next evolution of this, and that's my main thoughts as I was, like, watching the end of the movie, like, can't we just get another one? Yeah, and I was, like, actually wondering about that, because, like, a lot of these movies, like, for example, like, um, you know, like, Shaolin Master Killer or, like, you know, 36 Chambers. Like, I didn't find out two years later that there was actually, like, official sequels to it. So I'm, like, doing research for this. I'm, like, did they ever make a sequel? Because the Venom Mob made, like, 20 movies. I'm, like, one of these had to be, like, some sort of, like, spiritual sequel to this movie. But no, as far as I know, they never used it. I know there was, like, Crippled Avengers used the nickname, like, Return of the Five Deadly Venoms, but that had nothing really to do with this at all. So that's, like, a lot of misleading titles sometimes, unfortunately. They, they're not what you expect them to be. Well, that's the weird thing about, like, because you're saying, like, it, they just have another name, another movie that sounds like it, but it's totally independent. Like, we just watched, for the, bonus, the Patreon bonus episode, we did this movie Caligula, which is 
insane, basically just porn. But there's like a Caligula 2. And I'm like, what is this? And it's just like, oh, after Caligula was like this hit at this box office, a bunch of other people were just like, yeah, we're going to make movies that are called Caligula that are kind of like this, but just like try to cash in. It's kind of like the, uh, oh, fuck, what's the name? We're just like Alan Quartermain, like instead of Indiana Jones, or just like, you know, mm. Transmorphers. It's like those DVDs that you see like yeah. at CBS <laughs> next to the, it's just like, oh, like, some mom is just like, or some dad is just like, oh yeah, that's the movie that my kid wants to see. Like, I'm gonna buy that and bring him. Like, I'm gonna be the, I'm gonna be a hero parent. And it's just like, that's not the movie. I don't know what this is, but this isn't the movie. And so like, even if it's a Star Brothers movie, it's like the, the Return of the Five Venoms or whatever. Like, it's probably still cool, but it's not this. So whether it's like intentional misdirection or just like trying to get whatever, it just yeah, it feels like this is ripe for a sequel that just never got. It. It's kind of a bummer. No, I mean, it definitely works. Like, I bought Return of the Five Deadly Venoms. It ended up being Crippled Avengers, so I still love the movie. Um, but it wasn't, like, what I expected going into it. But, you know, it's a way to, I guess, like, you know, trick people in a, in a good way, I guess. I'm trying to think, is there anything else, Joe, any other thoughts about the movie, any other notes, any other things? We've got a couple of games to play, but anything else that you wanted to say about Five Deadly Venoms? No, I cut all mine in. I'm I'm glad we rewatched it, though. And I love uh, always exploring and re-exploring Shaw Brothers movies. They're some of my favorites. Yeah, and John, what about you? Any other notes, any other thoughts about this movie in particular? Yeah, I mean, like, I feel like everybody knows, like, The Mystery of Chess Boxing as being, like, the, the one Wu-Tang song that, like, heavily sampled it, obviously. But I feel like Snakes did it the best because that whole song is about the snake venom. And just, like, they kept using different samples of his of his uh, scene from the movie. Um, that made me, like, that's one of the songs I appreciate the most that had the actual sample from it. But as far as the movie goes itself, like, yeah, I love this movie. Like, I, I can never, like, not put it on. Like, it's always one of those movies that I'm, I'm, I know I'm going to like it. Like, it might not have the best ending, um, but it's definitely enjoyable from pretty much beginning to end. So, definitely up there um as far as my Shaw Brothers movies goes have you thought about making either lizard or snake or centipede or not snake lizard or scorpion or centipede because it feels like we got two venoms highlighted we can we need another three to like have an entire song Ooh. about them mm, that's true i can definitely see like the centipede have like you know yeah i can i can see that i'm pretty sure like people have made them there's been like definitely like you know wannabe wu-tang uh songs out there so i'm pretty sure oh, somebody I'm sure. Out there probably made like a centipede song but yeah i wouldn't mind uh doing it all right, so I'm going to ask you, and I think you've probably mentioned them already, but I want to just have it here officially on the record. So we've done this lap. Enter the Wu... Uh, no, no, Jesus. Now I'm all confused. I'm all like, you know, I'm, I'm talking about the samples, but we have talked about here on this lap. 36th Chamber of Shaolin. We did the Boxer's Omen. We did the Eight Diagram Pole Fighter. Now, obviously, we're doing the Five Venoms. If people out there want to watch two more Shaw Brothers movies, your own experience, your own Ooh. expertise, your own tastes... What two more, other than the ones we've done already, would you recommend? Ooh, uh, one arm swordsman definitely cool. sticks out because that was like awesome to see a guy literally with one arm with a sword just kicking ass. And then uh, Invincible Armor is another one. Like when I remember, I like the the cover art for that just sticks in my head is, is basically it's Pi May. So if you if you ever wondered like who this Pi May character is um, in Kill Bill, you want to see his actual movie, look up Invincible Armor, and you'll get you'll get his whole story. Cool. That's from 1977. There's an there's a U in Invincible Armor. So if you're yes. looking for it, and that's on Tubi and Voodoo. That's out there. Cool. Yeah, and, and people, some people like I know when I was when I was growing up, I used to get confused with another movie called Born Invincible because that was Carter Wong that had the white hair as well. That's another really good movie as well. So if you see Born Invincible instead of Invincible Armor, it's okay. It's a great movie. You can watch that as well. <laughs> oh, and One Armed Swordsman is also directed by Chang Che, which who, yes. who directed this one. So that's very cool. 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 Absolutely. Cool. Awesome. All right, let's watch the trailer. I don't know if I've ever seen... I mean, I, I know we've seen trailers for Shaw Brothers movies earlier this lap. I don't really remember how they were marketed, but this is three and a half minutes long. It's a very long trailer. It's called Five Venoms 1978 Original Trailer, posted by Kung Fu Movie Trailers in August of 2012. So let me know when you guys are ready to watch it. We can get it playing at the same time. I'm ready. I'm ready. All right, three, two, one, play. Get that good... Uh... Music coming in. Yeah, I'm curious to see what the trailer about this is like. This is why the trailer is three and a half minutes long because they have the full uh, <laughs> the 13 Shaw second intro. intro. <laughs> okay, so it's highlighting the actors. The actors and the director. Like, okay, here's the people you know, here's who's on the rise. We're going to bring them all together. Fusheng, etc. <laughs> Yeah, I wonder if this was like expendables for them. It's like yeah, it's all our, you know, all the guys together in one movie. Oh, yeah, good call. Pugilistic stars, like Oof. fighters. That's interesting. People were smarter in the 70s than they are today. I know that much. <laughs> I 
Okay, so we're getting some good fight scenes. I like this. I do love, and we just saw it right before you said that, I love when they have, like, the hands, the close-up on the hands, and, like, the sound, like, the sound effects are amazing, but, like, the wiggling of the hands, like, on the block, and then just trying to, like, go around the block or whatever, I just, it's, the choreography is amazing. Here's the Iron Maiden. Yeah. Mm. Just busting out. <laughs> See, that would be a selling point for me. If I saw that trailer and I saw that Iron Maiden, I'm like, oh, what's that? Yeah, and he just busts out of it. It's also awesome that there's no, like, I mean, I'm sure there are Iron Maidens probably, man, I don't know, maybe not, that, like, go around the head, too. Mm. But they're like, all right, we're gonna, like, his whole body's gonna be covered. It's like, well, you didn't cover his ears, so. Yeah, you're fucked. I wonder why they wanted to put Deadly. Did they, did they maybe think that Five Venoms wasn't, like, as I see Maneuver spelled wrong here. Uh, maybe they thought Five Venoms wasn't, like, um, you know, menacing sounding enough, so they had to put Deadly in there. I have no idea. I th uh... I think they probably cut the deadly to make it less threatening at the box office. Is what my thought was. The you think they cut time. deadly or they added? They they got rid of it. I think they cut deadly to make it like not as scary. That that see, that's one of my favorite moves right there. With the yeah, candles. the move with yeah. the candles. Yeah. Oof. Have you seen Eight Diagram Pole Fighter? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, that one with the candles too. Yeah. Really, it's really badass. The opening, like, 10 or 15 minutes of this, like, I, I mean, I like other movies more than this, but, like, the opening 10 or 15 minutes where, like, we get the setup, I'm like, mm -hmm. this is, like, setting up the coolest movie of all time. And I yes. think that's why, like, I wish it was a little bit better, like, a different movie, because, like, the opening is just, like, it's unmatched. It's it's amazing. That's some of my favorite parts of these Shaw Brothers movies, like, you know, 36 Chamber of Shadow when Gordon Liu's just fighting with those rings, like, that's just, like, that alone gets you, like, excited for the movie. Yeah. The training montage parts are sometimes better than the end battle scenes, I agree. Oh, yeah. for sure. The Scorpion Mask is so super cool. I can't believe that like more people haven't tried to like cosplay that, or like that mask isn't everywhere. You know what I mean? Because like, it's just so Yeah, Halloween badass. and shit. Yeah, I agree. I know like about 10, 15 years ago, I used to go to Chinatown down in New York, and I would see these masks there. I regret like, oh, really? giving myself a couple, but yeah, they definitely would sell them. That's pretty cool. It's kind of, if you, if you haven't seen, it's kind of like a luchador mask, with, like a giant red scorpion going down the nose and like ending at the, at the bridge of the nose. Okay, yeah, I'm sold. I'll see that movie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was awesome. Yeah, like, I have no idea what it's about, but, like, there's a lot of cool stuff in it, you know what I mean? So, I'm yeah. on board. Yeah, and, there, and there's no dialogue at all, like, just straight fighting. That's all you need to see. A lot of overlays about, like, this is that maneuver, this is that maneuver, these are these people you know, here's the director. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to play the letterbox game. So we go on letterbox.com and we try to get, it's very difficult, John, don't feel bad if you're, I mean, you listen to the other episodes, so you sort of know what this is, but like, it's just blind guesses in the dark. So don't okay. feel bad if you're nowhere close, let Joe guide you, we'll go from there. But for yeah. reference sake, Mad Max Fury Road, one of the most popular films on Letterboxd, has been seen by 1,038,000 people. The Five Venoms from cool. 1978, directed by Chang Che, starring Chang Shang, Philip Chung Fung, Sun Chen, and Liu Fang has been seen by how many people? Oof. Oh, I, I feel like the Shaw Brothers movies probably aren't well represented on Letterboxd. I could be wrong about that. Uh, I'm going to go into, into four digits. I'm probably going to go with, uh, you know what? Keep it in the Wu-Tang flavor. I'm going to go with uh, 3,600. I love that guess. <laughs> John, are you on Letterboxd? No, I've, I've kind of dibbled and dabbled with it. I don't have an account myself, but I have seen like other okay. people's like lists, basically. So I am aware cool. of, of Letterboxd, yeah. Fair enough. Okay, Joe, he says 3,600, which I just love as a symbolic guess. Um, I think that this movie is probably huge on Letterboxd. I think that they it's like a community that would really dig Shaw Brothers movies. I'm going to go pretty high, and I still don't think I'm high enough. I'll go 75,000. Mm, 75,000? Yeah. Uh, you're way too high, somewhere in between, between 3,600 and 75,000. Second guess. 36,000. There you go. 36,000. Okay. John, second guess. Oof. Uh, I'm going to go with 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 uh, 10,000. John, very close. We'll just wrap it there. 9345. Wow. So, ooh, okay. Kind of criminally nice. underseen. 9345. Average rating of three and a half. Most common a three and a half. And then almost basically tied a three and a four. But out of those 9,300 people, how many have this 
in their four favorite movies of all time. How many of their top four movies on Letterboxd? I bet it's a bunch. I would say 25. Out of what? Out of 9,300? Like out of everybody yeah. who logged it, you, every, every account can put four movies as their four favorite movies, mm. just either for fun or you know whatever, if you want to take it seriously. But Please. how many of these people have it in their top four? Joe says 25. Out of, yeah, I mean, the fact that these people saw this movie, they probably saw other Shaw Brothers movies that they probably liked better. I'm going to keep it like pretty in the middle, like five, 5,000. Joe was wildly. Oh, whoa, no, 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 not that many. Five, uh, five was a good guess. Yeah. yeah, twenty five was a good guess. Five thousand, way too, way too high. But the answer, twenty six. So Joe, very, very close. Okay. Twenty five. Twenty six people have in the top four. We're gonna go to Francis. which is an astoundingly high number, by the way. Like that's twenty six is still pretty, pretty good. high uh, for pretty good. considering what people have seen. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna go to Francis. E. Just for for your own sake. 2,400 people clicked like. I mean, not everybody uses the like feature, but like a lot of people, like the average rating is high. So like, you know, the 5,000, not bad, but uh, just it's it's a, sm a smaller subsection of that. But Francis E at FE17 has this in their top four. Watched it last May, said good movie, four stars, but put it in their top four. So, you know, whatever. Okay. <laughs> so Francis E's number four favorite movie is The Five Venoms. Their top three are all well-known movies, one from the 80s, one from the 90s, one from the 2000s. Two of them are action movies. One is a kind of a thriller. Joe, we have not covered any for any of our shows. Oh, fuck. I thought I was for sure one was going to be like Kill Bill. No, and I will say that none of them are martial arts at all, although one is not entirely out of left field. His favorite movie is... But, so, okay. We have one... I'll try to get you to guess the third one from the 2000s. Okay. Okay? Yes. Based on a book. Okay. And there's a big-ass knife on the poster. A knife on the poster. From the and you guys can also ask yes or no questions. I feel like with new people, yeah, yeah. we should especially make it a little bit easier. So if you want to ask yes or no questions or narrow it down however you want, we can go from there. Okay. Is it from the year 2000 or just the 2000s? Like... It's from 2000s. 2000s, from 2000, 2009, but I will say it is also from the year 2000. Hmm. So I'm based on a book. Remake. Based on a book. None of these are remakes, believe it or Ooh, not. Okay. As a knife, and it's based on a book. It's based on a book that I've read in the last year, year two years, and I saw the movie again. Female is it like director. Girl with the dragon tattoo. No, that's way too. Well, I don't know when the original was, but no. And the female director, which is sort of surprising given this movie's... I mean, there's not too many female directors, but... So it's pretty graphic? Pretty graphic. Knife on the poster. The top three actors credited on Letterboxd have all been major roles in Marvel movies or superhero movies. Weird. Okay. Not, not Marvel movies, superhero movies. Superhero movies. I want to, I want to clarify that. So Brie Larson's in it? Brie Larson, not in it. <laughs> oh, damn it. Would she it, would have been, can I, can been I, like... Can I guess? Yeah, go ahead. Can mm -hmm. I guess my movie? Is it Zodiac? No, that's too late. Earlier oh. than that. I know that had Robert Downey and, and Ruffalo. Oh. Good guess. Mm. Yeah, good guess. All right, here, here. I'm going to go to the uh, nano genres we learned about on the last one. Oh, yeah, fun. One go of ahead. the nano genres is cannibals, gruesome, graphic, shock, or gory. That's one nano genre. Cannibals. Yes. And a female director and that's Marvel. A theme, people. actually, yes. Uh, one of the nano genres is scary murder bodies. Hmm. Gory murderer screaming. You said Zodiac, but is it like... Oh, fuck. Can you name one of the Marvel people? Um, or is that going to be too easy? Well, no. I will say Willem Dafoe is in this movie. Ooh. Okay. Here is a, a very famous line from this movie. I don't know if it's going to help at all. Eggshell with Roman. No, I have no idea now. Character like, smiles makes it even worse. Nice. Eggshell with Roman. Mm -hmm. And Willem Dafoe is in it. There's a mm -hmm. knife on the poster. Year 2000. Other mm -hmm. Marvel people. Well, I mean, Marvel people is like, what? That's fucking everything. The, the star of this movie is a, a major superhero, but not Marvel. Oh, I know. What is it? Say it. American Psycho. American Psycho. Yes, oh, Christian Bale. Okay. Once you said that, because oh. I, I yes, and then you have uh, Jared Leto. Yeah, okay. And Willem Dafoe is the you, yeah, yeah, yeah. you did a good, you did a really good job of dancing around what is 
an easy movie to guess if you know what the guess is. Yes. Yeah, the, all three of these are very guessable. I just can't give yeah. you obvious clues. But yes, yes directed exactly. by Mary Harron. Good job. Based yep. on the book wow. by Brett Easton Ellis. Yep, good job. Jim. All right. Awesome, okay. Movie number two from the 90s. A movie that Brian covered on High School Slumber Party because it okay. takes place at least partially in high school. Uh, genres of this one are science fiction, thriller, adventure, and action. Directed by someone we talked about on the Caligula movie. Very well-known Dutch director. It's a high school movie that's not really a high school movie at all. But it also takes Dutch place partially director. in high school. Is it, um, what's his name? Not Verstappen, that's the race car driver. But the guy that's name sounds like that. Verhoeven. There is Paul Verhoeven, yep. A high school movie. I don't know any of, like, like I can't just, like, list Verhoeven movies. Monsters, Aliens, Sci-Fi, and the Apocalypse is a theme. And this is from the 80s? And this is from 1997. Hmm. 97, 97. Denise Richards in this movie? Oh, is Contact? it, um... Mm. Nope. Is it, is it Starship Troopers? Starship Troopers. Oh, oh there you go. Nice. Okay. And the number one... What's this guy's name? Francis's number one favorite movie of all time is a beloved cult classic from 1986. And it's a director, lead actor, star that have worked together many, many times. Cult classic, though, you said. It's also beloved. It's I don't know how popular it was at the time, but it's a cult classic, really high rating, action, comedy, adventure, fantasy. Tagline, adventure doesn't come any bigger. Adventure to, and it's uh, Jurassic Park's way later. Adventure doesn't come any bigger. Mm-hmm. 80, 80s, 86, you mm -hmm. said. Actor, director, duo. Very well known. They work together. Let's see how, how many times did these two work together. At least one, two, three, four. At least four times, if not more. Hmm. Well, at least five times. Robocop? No, we we covered that, right? So yeah, we have not covered this, but we have talked about the lead actor because he is in the Fastiverse. Whoa. Hmm. Okay, so and eighty six. It has to be um, uh, Mr. Nobody, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay. Good, good process of deduction. Yeah. So Kurt Russell film from nineteen eighty six, working with a director a bunch of times. Adventure doesn't come any bigger. Kurt Thematic Russell, Kurt Russell, oh. Thematically, kind of, sort of, it has definitely Asian influences. Oh, okay. See, I was going to say Escape from New York, because that was Carpenter and Russell, but Big Trouble in Little China. Big Trouble in Little China. Good Ooh. shit, brother. Nice. Thank you for carrying me, John. <laughs> I appreciate it. I didn't sure. realize that Kurt Russell and John Carpenter worked so much together, but yeah, wow. Yeah, they did that movie, they did The Thing, they did the Elvis movie, they did both Escape from New York and LA, so at least five times. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. That, was, that was really fun, guys. <laughs> Big Trouble in Little China, Starship Troopers, American Psycho, and the Five Venoms. I'm trying, like, with a new person to the podcast especially, I was trying to make it more easy and approachable, and I feel like... It could have been harder for John, man, today. <laughs> I know. He, he killed it, but... He definitely crushed. Good job. Yeah, I mean, those, are, those, are, those are four, like... I mean, I could see Big Trouble in Little China with the Five Deadly Venoms, like, kind of, you know, together, but, like, that's, Absolutely. A, that's a pretty good uh, mixture of favorite movies. But they're all beloved movies, for sure. I looked at literally all 26 people at this their top four, and, like, there were probably maybe two or three we could play, not a lot, but a lot of people just had, like, four random Shaw Brothers movies. I'm just like, yeah, that makes sense. Like, you just love, th th you love this yeah. thing. Like, this is the That's thing that I you thought. love. But, like, I don't know how to get you to guess, like, four movies that I've not heard of and, like, that are all, like, yeah, they're four of the, like, 300 martial arts movies they made. Just like, yeah, good luck, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to see, like, the connection between all four. I mean, they all kind of have, like, I guess a dark comedy twist to it in a way. I don't, not maybe not really Five Deadly Venoms, but all the other ones kind of have like some sort of humor to it, but not like straight up comedy. Yeah, they're all kind of bro movies. I don't think Francis, uh, I don't think English is Francis's first language because his bio is I watch movie, which whatever, but every one of his reviews is just says good movie. Even Death Note, which he gave half a star to, says good movie. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, maybe, maybe if he doesn't speak English as his first language, he just likes action and just likes, you know, explosions and, you know, spectacle and that kind of, I mean, American Psycho, maybe not, but the other ones for sure, right? So, yeah, it's pretty cool. Maybe he just likes movies that has like, you know, like keywords in it, like, you know, like deadly, uh, psycho, trouble, <laughs> you know, trooper, like, I don't know. <laughs> Stands that's, out for him. Yeah. That's as good of a guess as any. I, I'm into that. There we go. 
But John, thank you so much for joining us. This was a blast. It was. No, for sure. And I, I've highly enjoyed whenever you guys, um, you know, you guys made a fan of me just by popping up on, on you know, uh, Rocky Might Be a Picture Show with Nate Milton. So that's, hey, that's how the podcasting world works, right? You, you hear somebody from from one show and you start looking at what else they did. And then next thing you know, you find out something else that you love for those guys. And that's exactly what happened with, with Too Fast, Too Forever. Like, you know, you guys made a fan out of me just by doing a guest appearance on one of the shows on my network. So it's crazy how the world works. And we found out before the show aired that you guys go to the Palisades Mall, like to, yep. to watch movies, which is awesome. We do. That's, that, that's right by where i live so i already hey, invited him to well, future upcoming movies joe he, he's gonna be there so we're that's all what good i just there. said we're, we're gonna hit up john next uh next time that there's a uh fast and the furious movie that comes out you can join us at the palisades mall we usually get like a nice whole row of it there's a whole bunch of us so yeah you're welcome absolutely to and, and hopefully the rizza can get a role in the next fast and furious movie why not <laughs> he's someone we haven't added yet joey we always talk about like who would we add to the fast and the furious movies rizza has never come up and is a great addition yeah, yeah, here's you know here's Ludacris's older brother that we didn't know about. Oh, yep. love that. <laughs> so now, John, let us try to return the favor. Let's pay it forward. What you're on at least a couple different podcasts. What are people out there? What should they know about you? Where can they follow you? What do you want to share with our listeners? Yeah, for sure. I mean, if you guys are into wrestling, I do reports uh, every week for PostWrestling.com where I cover AEW, I cover uh, MLW, a couple other wrestling organizations, but I do have uh, the reports in podcast form as well with a show called Shot in the Dark every Wednesday on the Up Next feed where I cover a lot of these different wrestling shows. If you guys don't have time to watch them, we just want a quick little recap. It's a 15-minute podcast where I go run, run them all down for you. And then I also do guest appearances on like Up Next talking about uh, NXT and a couple other shows like that. But yeah, all my work through PostWrestling.com. Uh, check out my social social media, Cino Evil, C-N-O-E-V-I-L, and you'll see all my work on there. Love it. Very, very cool. Well, thank you once again for joining us. Joe, next week, no surprise here, we got F9. <laughs> nice. We are wrapping up the lap, though. We have F9, then we have our tune-up, then we have a bonus episode, then we kick off lap 11 with the Fast and the Furious again. So, you know, we're, That's awesome. we're like three weeks away in earnest from the new lap, which is crazy because that'll be the 11th time. But again, we've been teasing it most of the lap. In two weeks, the tune-up, you're going to have your actual real rankings for the first time in five laps, right? So this That's is very true. serious very business. True. John, we didn't, we didn't get a gauge of it. What do you think about the Fast and Furious movies? Do you like the franchise, hate the franchise, indifferent to the franchise? I was a fan from day one because the first one came out, what, 2001? So I was a sophomore in high school so it was like the go-to movie with all my friends that friday when it came out and uh, i watched every single one in theater since and they keep adding actors that i love uh tony ja like he's one of my favorite martial yeah, artists mm -hmm. from the ong bach movies protector and all that so once he was added I, I was all for it but yeah dwayne johnson i'm a big fan of dwayne johnson obviously with the wrestling tie-in john cena now as well but yeah i've been a big fan like i mean the movies haven't gotten progressively better for me like i wouldn't say they've gotten worse but they haven't like been like must watch as much as like they were like when four or five came out for me but i'm always going to see it when, it when it's in the theater i haven't missed a fast movie in the theater yet so i'm probably not at this point perfect well we will have to have you on for a future lap for a fast and furious proper film get your rankings find out Please. which character you are all that yeah. sort of fun stuff because this is great i don't know if it's gonna be next lap good but you know maybe lap 12 we got nothing but time as dominic toretto says nothing but time john but time Sure. I mean, of course, like me being a, you know, into the wrestling world, of course, my name is John Cena and of course sounds like John Cena. So the instant comparisons, you know, are going to be there. Oh yeah. Joe made that joke <laughs> in the intro. We didn't say it in this episode though, but yeah, in the intro, he did say John Cena. And I was like, no, close, but <laughs> yeah. Know. What are the chances, right? That I, that for, for a living, I talk about wrestling and then one of the wrestlers uh, just happens to have a name very similar to mine. I will say though, that we're doing this audio only. We can't see you. So it, it that's plays. perfect. Exactly. Yeah. I don't know, man. I don't know. Very, very weird. But for all things Too Fast, Too Forever, go to cageclub.me, facebook.com, slash Too Fast, Too Forever, or at Too Fast, Too Forever on Twitter and Instagram. Email us, family, at cageclub.me. Check out our Patreon page at Too Fast, Too Forever.com. Our store at Too Fast, Too Forever.shop. Come back next week for F9 Lap 10. I'm Joey Lewandowski. I'm Joe too. And that was John Ceno of the Shot in the Dark podcast and the Up Next Network and part of the post-wrestling family. And we'll tell you all about it. When we see you 